Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're going to take just another minute or two and wait for a few folks to show up, and then we're going to get started. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the second live stream from the Grouper Moon Project 2023. Uh, my name's Todd. Um, I'm a volunteer educator with uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. And I'm here with the Grouper Moon Project, which is a collaboration between um, the Cayman Islands Department of the Environment and Reef. And uh, we've been out here for several days already, um, diving on the, the aggregation, counting the fish, taking lots of video, collecting tons of data. And um, uh, yeah, the conditions for the first few days have been wonderful. Like the water was just flat, like glass, no, no current at all. To this morning, however, uh, it seems that things have changed and, and uh, the winds have kicked up a little bit. Um, but we're still out there uh, three times a day, out there diving first thing in the morning, then again at noon, and then again uh, in the evening. And um, usually, so we just had our full moon, which was Sunday. And the, the full moon is the, is the big indicator for when they're, the fish are going to arrive and start to spawn. Usually, it takes between three and five days after the full moon for the fish to spawn. Uh, but we got a surprise last night, and on, on basically the, the second night um, after the full moon, or, or really just one night after the full moon, they started to spawn, So, um, which is incredibly exciting uh, and, and surprising. So uh, towards the end of this live stream today, we're going to share some of the video that we took last night of the spawning. So be sure to stick around, and if you can't stay for the whole live stream, don't worry, because we're going to have this is recorded. It'll be on the um, Reef YouTube page. You can go on there um, and, and watch it anytime that you want. Um, and, and also a reminder that we're going to be on again tomorrow, uh, same time, 11 o'clock. And that will be our uh, underwater live stream uh, where we'll take you on a dive on Bloody Bay Wall, which is a famous dive site here on Little Cayman. So... Um, as we did yesterday, I'm going to introduce you all to some of the really wonderful, and actually before I introduce everyone, I'm going to pull some of these classrooms on screen so we can see you all. Hello. It's so awesome to see you all here. Thank you for joining us. And, and I want to thank all of your teachers for going the extra mile and bringing you all here. Um, it, uh, teachers have a huge job and, and doing extra, like showing up for, for this live stream takes a lot of effort. So I appreciate all of you for, for making the effort to be here uh, with us today. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce uh, a few of the, uh, the staff members on the DOE. As we go, if you have a question that you're dying to ask, you can let your teacher know and they can, they can type it into the chat. 
Um, or I'll be asking if there are questions kind of periodically throughout the live stream. And if you've got a question, raise your hand and you can come up and ask your question. If you're too embarrassed to ask, you can just have your teacher uh, ask for you. But thanks you all so much for being here. All right. So um, I'm going to introduce you guys. to we, we've, got, we've got a lineup today. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce you to Jonathan Rivers. Jonathan, will you come on up? Okay, and I'm going to have a seat right there next to me. All right. Morning, guys. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? Good. How are you? Excellent. So, can you can you introduce yourself and just say what is your your technical job on the Group Moon project this year? Okay. Uh, my name is Jonathan Rivers. Um, one of the captains and support crew and divers for this project. Um, you know, it's my first time doing it, so I'm pretty excited to be here, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get to see a lot of different things and something I've never seen before, so. And so what are you doing on the project? Like, you're here with DOE. Are you diving? Are yeah. you, yeah? Yeah, I'm here with DOE. I'm diving. Um, I'm mainly diving and support staff, and um, we've been doing, you know, a few different things. Uh, like what? Uh, the stereo video, the fish face identification. Um, that's two of the things I've done so far. So the stereo video, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, but that's it's two cameras at the end of yeah, the Yeah, there's two ring. cameras on the end of a um, bar in the middle, uh -huh. and they're slightly counted inwards. And you just, you know, you, get, you don't want to get too close to the fish, but you kind of get optimal distance from the fish. And what that does is gives you an idea how big the fish is. Oh, so that's yeah. for size. Yeah, that's for size. The yeah. Stereo video is for size. And then the fish faces is with actual GoPros, yeah. right? And you're going around, and I kind of described it yesterday as um, you guys were creating a fish Facebook. Yeah, um, pretty much. Where, yeah. where you're collecting all of the, the faces of the different grouper. Now, why is that helpful for us to have their faces? Um, well, that's cool because, yeah, if you, if you get that, what you can do is in the future, if that same fish is spotted, they'll be able to tell, okay, this fish was spotted on, you know, 5th of February or 6th of February, you know, 2023. And that's pretty cool because then you know if that fish has been continuing to come back to that right. same location this morning. And, um, you know, this is all stuff I'm learning during this, so I'm hope I'm, I hope I'm doing this, I'm saying this right. But You're saying it perfect. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that, that, I guess it would help to, you know, make sure that population is staying stable and healthy. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah, kind of creates like a roster. These are yeah, all, that's, this, that's this, is our, this is our school, right? Yeah, and, exactly. and we can check them off each year yeah. and then we can see the new ones come, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. You know, each year, I guess you're going to have new, you know, younger fish coming into the group. So... You, know, you get those guys into the database as well and you also can go back and see you know the older guys that have been there the whole time you know and yeah yeah i guess they're teaching the new ones the, the way that's awesome yes yeah, so that's cool well i was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your story where where did you grow up and kind of what uh what were the steps that you took to to becoming being here with the doe on on the project um, well, I grew up in West Bay on Grand Cayman. Um, Where did you go to school? Uh, John A. Cumber. So, oh, yeah, we have some teachers there, hey, from John A. Cumber here today. Awesome. <laughs> well, maybe I know some, some of those guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I came up in West Bay. I, Were you diving and snorkeling a lot as a, um, as a yeah, kid? Yeah, I spent a lot. Most of my life's probably been on the water. My family has always had, you know, been fishing and stuff. Yeah. And I got certified. When I got certified, it was 12. So I really? got certified right away. I was, right like, away. I was at the dive shop on my birthday going, hey, can I get certified, guys? <laughs> and awesome. um, I did that actually through the Boy Scouts of Cayman. So um, I did that, you know, there. And I worked in tourism for a long time. I've been, you know, dive boats and diving. And then I, I got in with the DOE. And I've always been interested in the, in the environment. Mm -hmm. So when I got the opportunity to work with DOE, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. And, you know, I've been with these guys for the last two years and it's been wonderful. And what, what, what's some of this, the things that you've done? You, you weren't necessarily doing all research. You were doing other, like, were you captaining? And yeah, yeah, I mostly do the captaining. And, um, so I've been, you know, around to the different islands there and, you know, taking these guys out on different projects. I've worked on a few different projects for the, you know. For the so what are some of the, like, what's fun about being a captain? I get to be on the water all the time. It's my yeah. office, you know. Yeah. You know, other people are sitting at a desk at their office. I'm yeah, no. on the water. You know? Yeah, you're not at a desk at <laughs> no, all. No, no, I'm, I'm out of the water. That's my office. I've got a you know, beautiful 360 degree view, and I, you can't can't beat that. <laughs> so, have you been out diving on the aggregation so yeah. far? Yeah, I've done um, a few dives here, um, two different locations here to see the aggregation, and there's been you know so many groupers. It's been great to see. Um, I know I've, over the years, the population has declined a bit, and now it seems like they're coming back. So, right. you know, for me, it's a, it was an amazing opportunity to get to see it. And um, so I'm hoping 
you know, get to see this for many more years to come. Because yeah. I love, love the kids for the future to be able to see this as well, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, That's why we're doing it for you guys, right? Yeah. So that we yeah. have this into the future. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being yeah, thanks here. Thanks for having Jonathan. me. Uh, yeah, it's it great to be on this project. It was great to meet you. It was good to meet you. You guys, too. yeah, you can, you know, one of these days you might be out here diving with these guys. So <laughs> you can be explaining what's going on. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, have a good one. All right. Have a seat. Um, uh, let's have Paul come on over. Hi, Paul. Good morning. Good morning, Todd. Good morning, Todd. Todd. How you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? Good morning, everyone. How you doing? This is Paul. Can you can you just introduce yourself and what your role is on the Group Moon project? Uh, well, my name is Paul Chin. Um, I'm one of the more senior officers um, from the Department of Environment. I've been with the department for about 13 years. Um, I've been on the Group of Moon project for well over a decade now. And uh, really? How long, actually, have well, you been on this in, project? For the 13 years that I've been employed with DOE, I think I've been on the project about 12 years out of that 13 years. Someone was saying that maybe you've done the most dives on DOE. Here. It's, it's quite possible. It's quite Interesting. possible. It's quite possible. Interesting. Um, after doing three dives a day, every day, every group per moon, um, it, it, it tends to mount up. I mean, you get, yeah. you, your numbers tend to get really tall. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, I um, I may know some of the people um, on the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, I had a son who went through the Johnny Cumber system, awesome. so I may know some of the teachers here, um, on there, some of the students on there. Shout out Johnny Cumber! <laughs> How you doing, guys? Um, I went through the um, the, um, the system in the, in Grand Cayman. So you grew up in Grand Cayman. You went to Grand Johnny Cumber. Cumber. I, I didn't go to Johnny. Oh, Cumber. you didn't. My son went to Johnny. Oh, Cumber. your son. Got it. But I did grow up and I went through the system. I went to Georgetown Primary, then mm -hmm. I went to Red Bay Primary, and then I went to George Hicks and John Gray, which is now um, the two high schools are now merged into one, which is now just John Gray. Right. And then um, after that, I took my tertiary education um, over to Hong Kong. I was in um, Hong you Kong. You went to Hong Kong. Kong. Hong Kong. What yes. were you What were you studying there? Um, well, I went there to do my um, international baccalaureate. And actually, that's where I found my calling. Um, I was doing some... Um, some volunteer research for the WWF, the World Wildlife Federation. Really? And, um, I was collecting data one day. Um, I was actually studying to try to be a mechanical engineer. And um, while collecting data one day, um, I came along a seahorse and the seahorse happened to be pregnant. And after going home and doing a bit of research, realizing that how did you know it was pregnant? You could tell. You could tell. It was, it was, it was definitely quite, quite large. OK. Quite large torso. Um, and then after going home and doing some research and realizing that it's the males that carry the, yeah. the babies of the seahorse, that actually absolutely mesmerized me. And then I fell in love with the ocean. Even though I grew up with the ocean, mm -hmm. you grew up in that kind of environment. Sometimes you take the ocean for granted and you don't realize what you have until it's not there anymore. Right. So after realizing um, that that was my calling, I've been doing it ever since. Um, luckily for me, after um, graduating from um, the University of Essex in England. Okay, so, so you went to Hong Kong. Yes, and then I went to the UK for five years. Where I so that was kind of after you decided this was going to yes. be your area of research. Yes, exactly. So okay. then I started applying to universities that specialize in marine biology. I ended up at the University of Essex in England. Um, where I did my bachelor's and my master's. Uh, and after that, I came home. And luckily for me, um, six months into uh, applying for jobs, I landed a job at the DOE. Um, prior to that, I was doing volunteer work for them. So you started during, as a volunteer? Yeah, I started as an intern and during my summers, uh, helping out where I could, um, helping on some of the projects there, like the, uh, the turtle nesting project that happens uh, from uh, the beginning of April all the way down to sometimes in November. And that's um, where you go around and actually check on the nest check, check on the nest and then we help the babies um come out and we've had a record number of um babies being released over the last few years um somewhere in the vicinity of fifty thousand babies in a season um and i went from being an apprentice in that project to now spearheading that project wow. so i'm actually in charge of that project so and, and now i'm also a big part of this project as well so um you know after being there for 13 years you end up in all these different various projects and um, you help out wherever you can. And for me, this job is, is extremely rewarding because you get to see all the, the results and all the benefits of your work come to pass and you see all the numbers increasing, the number of fishing. Well, and you've increasing. really seen that, yes. the dramatic increase because yes. you've been here from the beginning, from the beginning and yes. seen every year. Yes. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. It's, it's, and, and you know what? You'd think after doing it for, for over a decade, you get, you get tired of seeing the same thing over and over. It never gets boring, no. you know, and especially when you see the numbers go from just a mere couple thousand to 
well over you know into the five figures it's it's absolutely mesmerizing just to see and to know that you're part of something that's making a huge difference in the world you know? yeah yeah well and we were yesterday um dr mccoy was on here with us and he had shared some um stereo vit footage from the BRAC. Mm -hmm. And we saw quite a few fish on the BRAC as well. Right. We thought that our actual population was um, was almost down to nothing. Um, it was last year that we actually went and did a scout dive and we managed to come across about 2,500 fish. And that's when we knew that our, our population was actually starting, was recovering. We found them on the eastern end of the BRAC. And um, now we're just going to, we're going to try to incorporate the BRAC every year now as well as yeah. part of the as part of the um, the project and actually it's so funny that um, over the ten years we've also seen shifts in patterns that we thought was a pattern for the aggregate have yeah. now shifting as you mentioned earlier it went from from spawning three days after the full moon to just one day yeah and we think that that's just that's based on the the, the population density so, just increasing so maybe an indication of the health of the exactly wow. exactly exactly so you know um, so what we know of the Nassau grouper could just be based on, you know, evolutionary processes and just survival processes. So now as the population starts to regroup and, and, and get larger, we're now seeing those, what we know of the Nassau grouper population change a little bit. Right. So we're hoping that we're going to continue and we're going to continue and, and just see where it goes from here and just continue to gather data. And hopefully we'll have the answers that we've been looking for for all this time. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just amazing uh, to see all the, to see this wonderful group of people come together every year, yeah, yeah. and and to see more and more the the community, the Cayman communities right. become part of this and right. and to take ownership of the Group of Moon project. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, you know what? You you when you come here for every year, it's not always the same group of people, and then you manage to forge friendships that are that last a lifetime. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I've met you for a few years yeah. now, and um, there's a few people. Jonathan is new to the project. You know, we got a, a few more other people from the reef who come down here, students yeah. from the doing their masters and their PhD and you manage to forge these these friendships and they last a lifetime yeah. you know you can't ask for anything better no <laughs> oh that's an inspiring story thank you thank so you much, much Paul. Guys. awesome why don't you go have a seat and we're going to introduce I'm going to introduce you guys to one more person um Cody come on up hi I have a seat there Cody good morning good morning how are you all right how are you Todd I'm hanging in there I've known you for a while. You've been on this project quite a while. Yeah. Um, tell, can you tell, tell, tell everyone uh, who you are and what your role is with the DOE? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, yeah, my name is Cody Panton. I'm a research officer with the Department of Environment. I've uh, been there uh, seven years now, officially. What does it mean, research officer? Like, what does that job entail? Um, <laughs> kids you yeah, know what that's like oh i i have to Sorry. i have to quickly do a shout out because i see uh spot bay just showed up today spot bay hello welcome i'm going to pull you guys onto the screen so we can see everyone that's here today i'm so excited that you guys are here and that your teacher's feeling better and that y'all are here with us today thank you for joining us um okay so what is it that you do on the grouper moon project um basically a little, bit, a little bit of everything. Really? Like, so the fish face stuff, the um, stereo video, sometimes driving boats as well. Really? So yeah. you're you're also a captain? Yeah. Nice. Sort of uh, captain. Yeah. You can drive the boat. Okay, I can drive the boat. Yeah. <laughs> not not the big boat, one of the smaller boats. And um, and uh, Spot Bay, uh, we were just talking a moment ago about how uh, a group of the of DOE and reef researchers went out to the BRAC two days in a row and saw quite yeah. a few fish. Were you were yeah, you out I, on that? I, I was I was on the BRAC trips. Yes. Tell us about that. What was that like? Was that expected? Was that surprising? Um, well, compared to as Paul said earlier, found around 2,500 fish last year, and it was about the, the same number I saw this time. And but before you guys had gone last year, you thought it was almost, the, the population had been pretty much decimated, that there was maybe only a couple hundred. Yeah, yeah, previous years we'd gone out there and only found several, several hundred fish. Well, okay, so I have a question. This came up yesterday and I couldn't answer because um, there wasn't, a, there wasn't everyone here to answer this question for me, but 
do you, do you think that the increase in population on the BRAC is due to the protections that have been placed on the on the grouper? Yeah, I would think so. And because um, some of the kids asked yesterday, well, what happens if you catch a grouper? What, or you know, and, so, and I was like, well, there's there's times of the year when you can and you can't, and then there's rules when you can about how big they are. Can you tell us what the, what how that works? Um, when is the no catch season? Uh, the no catch season, I believe, is from December through March. March, okay, and that and that's to protect them. That's to basically cover during the spawning season. Got it. Yeah, and then and there's also the, the the spawning aggregation sites that you're not allowed to fish there, so you so you can't can't, can't, can't even accidentally catch a grouper. Okay, if you're yeah, you because know, you shouldn't be fishing at the spawning sites anyway. So the spawning site is protected year round. You're not supposed to fish there, or is it just during the aggregation season? Sorry, just yeah, during, yeah, spawning. Just during spawning okay. season. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, so when it's not spawning season and um, someone goes out and catches a grouper, do you, what are the are there catch size limits? How big? How big does it need to be? Sixteen to twenty-four inches, and I imagine that that's because. By that time, they've been old enough to have reproduced already, spawn. Right. Is that the yeah. idea? That's the idea, yeah. So, yeah, catch them once they've already had the chance to spawn. And, yeah. Wow. So. Well, thank you so much for being here, Cody. You guys, right. give Cody a big hand. Give him a wave. <laughs> thank you for being here. You can go have a seat. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So um, I see that there was a couple of questions from um, Cayman International School that I want to address uh, first before we we bring on our next um, scientist and then we share some amazing video um, that we took last night of the spawning. Um, so Cayman International School asked, how many fish are at the spag? Um, and actually, I'm going to change things around a little bit, and I have a professional here on uh, the reef team who has talked or has done quite a bit around counting the fish and, and estimating exactly how many fish there are. And how do we estimate how many fish there are? I mean, have you seen thousands of fish? It must be really hard. So, Lynn, hi. Hello. Everyone, this is Lynn. Say hi to Lynn. Can you tell us who you are and what you do on this project? So my name is Lynn Waterhouse and I'm one of the volunteers on this project and I started in 2013 as one of the graduate students coming here. 10 years? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So you're not a graduate student anymore. Nope. I'm done. I finished my PhD and now I'm a professor at University of Minnesota. Okay. Now, when I go out and you guys see, have seen the videos of the, of the spawning aggregation, right? And you would imagine that trying to count those fish, they all look the same, even though we know that they all have really unique facial patterns. They all look the same. And so how do you actually count them and figure out how many there are? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we've learned that divers, they're good at counting things, but when you get over a thousand things, it's really hard to do. You're focusing on so many things underwater, so we can't get really accurate numbers. So what we actually do is we do a tagging study. Okay. So this involves a little math. So first of all, I love math. Can people raise their hands if they like math too? Do we have any math? Yes. Okay, right there. Awesome. All Although right. I saw a lot of hands stay down. That's okay. The, oh, there we go. Good. Yeah. Good. I, so I love math. So this is where we use some math in here. And so we actually put out these tags on the fish. So it's a little colorful plastic tag, mm -hmm. kind of like giving them an, an earring, a little decoration. Right. And so you can see this underwater. We don't know how many we put out. And then on subsequent dives, we count 50 fish. How many tags do we see in the fish? Wait, no, you do know how many you put out, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we do. Okay. We know exactly how many we put out. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. I was just um, clarifying. And then we do tag counts for 50 fish. How many tags do we see? And then we can use the proportions to figure out how many total fish there are out there. So let's say you put out 100 tags. And then you go out and do, do you count just as many as you can see, or is, is there a, a structure framework that you're using for how? There, there is. How do you do that? So we count for 50 fish. Okay. So every time you look, you're counting 50. Yes. And then of those 50, you're figuring out how many have tags. Yes. And then you're using that to create an estimate of the total number of fish. Yep, exactly. Okay. So if we saw, if you counted 50 fish, you saw five tags, you knew you put out 100, then you'd know that there's roughly 10,000 fish out there. Right? Isn't that amazing? So it's equal proportion. So we do a little bit of math on the back yeah. end. So 
I do a combination of normally I'd be in the field a little bit and then I get to go do a lot of math and computer work, right. uh, which is really exciting because we figure out how many are out there. Now, I also know that there's an algorithm. You guys know about algorithms that that helps crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that what is an algorithm and how does that help us estimate the number of fish? Yeah. So we're talking about counting 50 fish, but we don't just go do that once. We actually have divers out there this morning. There were six divers and they were counting fish, 50 fish again and again and again. So we get a lot of replicates. Okay. So we're doing this and then we're looking at on average. So that's your data. You're collecting yep. as much data, like a massive amount of yes. data, right? Hundreds of counts of 50. Okay. Uh, so people are going to be busy doing this over the next couple of days. Right. And then we use a computer program that analyzes it. And we also actually uh, include a part of the algorithm that says, well, for example, Steve and Paul, they've been doing this for a long time. So they might be really good at counting. And then somebody who's brand new to the project, right. the first time they're out there, they might accidentally be a little bit more drawn to the tags or, or they might have a little different perception. Also, people have different visions. Mm -hmm. I'm nearsighted, so I actually have a hard time seeing far away. Okay. So I might be a little bit worse at seeing tags than some people. Sure. And so we modified the algorithm, this is part of my PhD work, to say that different people are actually seeing slightly different proportions of tags, and it takes that into account. So it takes into account like the experience of the person that's actually doing the counting. Yep, the fact that we're all different. Wow. And so at the end of last year, you, you took all the, the 50 counts, that all, all that data, you put it into the computer, you crunched the computer crunches, crunch, and how many, how many did we think, what was the estimate last year? So last year, the, the best estimate was 8,000 fish here on Little. Wow. And if you guys um, have watched the documentaries that we've shared, you'll know that when we started, um, we believe there was maybe 16, 1500 fish yep. on the, on the aggregation. So that's a huge increase, although that's taken a lot of time. And that's something that a lot of people ask about. Why, why is it that it's taken, you know, over 10 years for us to actually see that huge increase? And is that more to do with the NASA's long life or how, why do you think it's taken so long for us to see that? So it, two things, it has a little okay. bit to do with the NASA's long life. So it takes about four to seven years for our NASA grouper to get big enough for it to come to the spawning aggregation. So before that, they're just young. And is know. that all fish are like that? Or is that like, a like because some fish can spawn like when they're pretty young, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, it depends species by species. So okay. NASA grouper are a pretty long lived species yeah. and it takes them that long until they're ready to come to the aggregation and reproduce. So they, so they have to go through like seven years of life, making it on the reef before they're even old enough to go and start spawning. Yes. And so that's why once we put the protections on, it really did take that long for us to start seeing the numbers increase. Yeah. And then the other part too is, so NASA groupers, um, once they reproduce their eggs, go out with the ocean and the ocean currents move them around for about 30 days until they settle on the reefs. Mm. And the ocean currents might not take them back to Little Cayman each year. So some years we might not get a lot of babies back here. And there, when I first started, there was, um, there was a project called the Drifter Project. What was that? It was, wasn't that researching that? Yes. Well, can you tell us a little bit about what that was? So early on in the project, um, and even through like 2014, we were still deploying uh, these giant floats. And it's like a huge sock, It's right? a huge sock <laughs> attached to a floating ball at the surface. And the floating ball had a GPS unit that said where it was. And the sock hangs down in the water and it actually moves at a depth in the water, about 20 feet, which is where the NASA grouper eggs float to. So it was moving with the eggs, which another graduate student did work that confirmed that. Um, Seakeeper stayed out for, I think, nearly two days yeah, chasing two days the straight. eggs. Um, and seeing where the eggs were going and if they follow these GPS units yeah. and they confirmed it, it yeah. does. Well, I think a couple of the, the drifters actually ended up back on the reef. They did. That, yeah. that year, oh, and I forget what year we did that, but that year the drifters wound up back on the reef, which means probably the eggs and larvae wound up back on the reef. Uh, which means seven years from then, we should be seeing babies. So do you think that... Um, or, I'm sorry, recruits to the spawning aggregation. Do, do you think that perhaps um, the fish have a, a, a current app on their iPhones that they're looking to see when the currents are going to bring those those eggs back? Or they don't have... I mean, what do you... do? What we do you think? We don't know. We don't know yet. It's a, it would be a great thing to study. So this is a mystery, right? We don't know, but the fish, the fish seem to cue in on something that's telling them 
okay, tonight's the night that you're going to have the best possibility of those eggs staying close. Yeah, and also the location. We know where they are out there, but sometimes they move, you know, 100 yards or so. In a few years, they moved like half a kilometer, for, and maybe it had something to do with the currents because maybe maybe they are able to figure it out. Right. Or maybe it's something different. Maybe they're just attracted to where all the other fish are and it's hang out with your friends. Okay, okay. We don't know. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Lynn, for coming. You guys, give, give Lynn a hand. Here, I'm going to bring in, hey, came in prep, welcome. So glad to see you guys here. Okay, so um, as I was saying, thank you, Lynn. Um, last night was really just the first night after the full moon. And um, I've been, this is my 13th year on the project, and pretty much um, it takes, th you know, three to five days after the full moon for the grouper to spawn. Um, but last night, would the one night after full moon, um, they started spawning. Uh, so I'm going to bring up, uh, I'm going to introduce you guys to Christy, Dr. Christy Simmons pat Gill, who um, is one of, did I do that? Uh, pat and Gill Simmons. I'm bringing her up here, introduce you guys. And we're going to talk about what we saw. Hey. Hi, Christy. Hello. How are you? Hi, everyone. So can Hi. you can you just first introduce yourself and say, you know, what's your role with Reef in this project? Absolutely. Thanks, Todd. Yeah. So my name is Christy Simmons. Dr. Christy Pattengill Simmons is my official name. Doctor. Yes, doctor. And um, I have um, I'm one of the executive directors at Reef, and I've been part of the Reef organization for a really long time. That's been my role. And I've been really excited to be able to be partners with our, our friends and colleagues at the Department of Environment for over 20 years. This is actually my 20th year, 20 20th years. year getting to come and have the privilege to be able to work on this project with all of the great folks like you saw earlier. And well, and I think that yesterday, I don't think that a lot of people understand, um, uh, uh Dr. P uh, Simmons Pattengill, and, and her husband, um, Bryce Simmons, who was here yesterday, you guys got to see Bryce yesterday. You guys have had children on this project mm -hmm. with you that whole time, right? Yeah. Like, so there's always been a group of kids with, with this team. And this is the first year the with first that. first year, yep. Yeah, they, our oldest daughter came our, that very first year. And now she's away at university, so she's not oh. here. Um, and the others are, are home at at secondary school. So um, yeah, it's been a, my role mostly is helping with all of the logistics as you've kind of heard and seen. We have a lot of people and a lot of people to coordinate just everything from, from flights to what food we're gonna bring over, all of that equipment that we've gotta bring, working with our friends at, at DOE to make sure that the vessels that we need and everything that, that's over on Grand Cayman gets brought over here mm -hmm. when we get here. So lots of little tiny things it's not just we get here and go out on the boat and it's all all easy we oh no get everything lined up and ready and then ready for things to change right like yesterday we got to the dock we were all ready to go and then our, were you expecting spawning to happen when well you yeah there? no we were not like no. you said that's the earliest we've ever seen so we really had to we we kind of knew that middle dive that we did yesterday afternoon we could tell by the way that they were acting. They get, you know, that bicolor. They look like they've put on their tuxedos. Right. They're getting really ready for the party. And they were a lot of that. And they were acting really just excited. Mm -hmm. And we knew. So we had to switch course pretty quickly and, to be and prepared. bring out the science equipment that we needed for them. Because what is it? What is it that you're doing when they're out there spawning? And we're going to I'm going to share a couple of clips with you and and. Uh, Christy will talk us through those, but can you say a little bit about what what is happening? You're not doing the fish faces and right. the tagging when they're spawning. Yeah. You're what are exactly. you doing that? Yeah. So our primary job when the when they're spawning is we're there documenting, we're we're noting down when they start spawning, like how how many minutes before the sunrise or sunset, um, how many spawning bursts we see, and then a team of people will be in charge of going into some of the the spawning burst, Dr. Um, Croy yesterday talked about the dance, you know, where they kind of swirl up and then they release their gametes. And, and so we'll have folks have a Ziploc bag, just a regular old kitchen Ziploc. It's and not a special, it's no, not like not this sort of is made by thing. NASA. No, no it's <laughs> regular old Ziploc. Ziploc. Okay. The kind with the slider, that's the easiest. Okay. <laughs> um, and you just go and as soon as the 
the um, cloud burst is there. You swoop the, the open Ziploc around a few times, you close it, and then your dive buddy, who you always have with you for safety, is videoing that whole time. So we're getting a video of the, of the um, group of fishes mm -hmm. and then the sample. We have a big number written on the back. Okay. With a Sharpie. So and that helps can, you keep track of That's right. this bag goes with that video and right. those fish. And then we know about how many fish were in that because it's really variable. Sometimes you'll see just two or three fish mm -hmm. in that little spiraling dance. Sometimes there's 40 fish. So we're trying to better understand how all of those dynamics work because yeah. a lot of this project is a is considered a blueprint of for other countries, other entities to be able to know how to successfully conserve their Nassau grouper. The Cayman Islands really are leading the way. So you guys are, are right there at the forefront. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see some of the video from last night. I'm going to, I'm going to. And I see there's a couple questions here. Too. But we, we already we got, got to those. We oh, got them. Yeah, that we was got the one late yeah. answer. All yes. Right. Okay. So hold on one second and I'm going to bring up some video and I've got about five clips that I'm going to go through and I'm going to have uh, Dr. Um, Christie share a little bit about what's happening in each of those. So just give us a few minutes and then when we're done, there'll be time for questions. So those of you that have questions, be thinking of them because as, as soon as we're done sharing these videos, you can ask all the questions you want. Okay, so here. Oh, yeah. So you can see there's the tuxedos, you know, most of the fish take on that. That's both the, the males and the female fish will take that coloration on. And they were all chasing a dark phase fish. You can see that there, kind of a darker phase. And so that's probably the female in the front. And um, they're trying to, the, a lot so of- So you think like, happened, yeah. like right here, yeah. like right here is probably the female. And then all of these tuxedos, those are probably males. Probably. Okay. Yeah. We don't know that for sure, but definitely the lead fish is the female. And we know that as soon as that female's done, that, that they will switch from bicolor to dark to, to the really light, to the regular barn pattern. It doesn't really, they, we've seen one fish go through all four phases at the same time. Does it take them very long to change colors? No, it really? Can be instant. Instant, mm -hmm. like yeah. an octopus. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another one. It's a little dark, but this is one of the spawning bursts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can see that was kind of the very end. What they, they probably all came up from, from pretty deep. And then there's the, that's just kind of the top. And you can see there um, the cloud. And that's normally where a diver would go through and swim with the Ziploc bag to collect some of those. And someone asked me yesterday, is that a concern? Are we limiting the population by, by taking going some of those eggs and there's you know millions and millions of eggs released each or gametes released each night right and well i heard that a, a, an adult a mature female can have over a hundred thousand eggs is that yeah. is that true? yes yeah so it's a lot wow so there is you know uh, a lot of factors come into those little um gametes right away they've yeah. got Little right up, last night, actually, we had. Well, and I'm going to show a video right? right now of what you're talking about. So sometimes they'll be what we call egg predators. They'll be little, yeah, these are little rainbow runners and some scad there that came in right after um, things got started last night. And they're picking off um, the, the gametes there. As so it's not members. just the grouper out there by themselves. There's other fish out there. And these, these fish that we're seeing here at the beginning of this video, they're specifically out there to, to nibble on yeah. the feast that's, mm -hmm. that's being provided, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and do you always see fish like this out there at that time? Yes, that's right. Yeah, okay. they've clued into this um, activity and they're going to be out there. Um, the other critter that's clued into this are sharks. Right. right? And we talked, I think you all yeah. talked about that a little bit last night. And we did see a couple sharks last night cruising the perimeter of the, of the aggregation there. All right, so let's take a look. We've got a couple more clips. I hope you guys are being able to see these all right. Here we go. All right. Yeah, so that's a kind of a better, you can see one of our divers is, is videoing, and that was a pretty big. Um, so that big cloud there. that we're seeing mm -hmm. there, that's the gametes, yeah, right? That's right. That's right. And so you see that this one is a much bigger. Uh, you know, kind of spiral. There's probably 40 or 50 fish in there. Where and that's that? the dance that you're talking about when they go together and they spiral up. Yep. That's okay. right. And this is happening right um, at, you know, we got in about 20 minutes before sunset 
And we think that when it gets really dark, they stop. They'll all settle back down on the reef for the night. So it's just at that kind of dusk time mm -hmm. that you really are seeing it happen. Yeah. And why? Why dusk? Yeah, well, probably to the it's the safest time from predators and from egg predators, from predators on the fish and predators um, at for the eggs. Okay, so yeah. you think really it's about it's like that's the most opportune time to protect the eggs. Mm -hmm. And we think that and you know we know that you know sometimes it's it's a couple nights after full moon. Sometimes it's been as late as five nights after full moon, six nights. And it see, that seems the drifter studies that, um, that Dr. Waterhouse was talking about, where she said we, we put in those drifter balls, mm -hmm. that told us that probably there's something special about what the water is doing on the nights when they choose to spawn. It seems to have these little eddies. They're called eddy currents. They're, the water's kind of spinning, and it, we think it's because it keeps the larvae close to home when they, get, when they spawn. Instead so of all, immediately drifting away. It's like all of these behaviors and choices that the group are making is really specifically to protect those fish, mm -hmm. to protect the babies. To increase the likelihood of as many of them surviving to little baby Nassau grouper. Yeah. And making it back to a reef where they can survive. And you were asking, it's not just, you know, we've got the predators, the egg predators and the group of predators. But then there's a lot of other fish. We've seen over 20 different species using this site. For reproduction. So what other really species do you see site. out there? There's several other species of grouper. So black grouper, um, yellowfin grouper, then the Nassau, of course. Tiger grouper. Tiger I've grouper, seen. yes. And then there's several. There's um, uh, oceanic triggerfish, leather oh. jackets. Yeah. There's um, we see uh, several species of jacks out there spawning. Last year, we had video of um, a hammerhead that was oh. out there. In fact, I'll post that on the blog for you guys. And I see here, Cayman Prep has a question for you. How many eggs do you collect in one Ziploc bag? Yeah, so that depends a little bit on how lucky you get with your, your swooping. So your how swooping skills really yeah. and, are important. And the number of fish that were there. I think I did one last night that I'm pretty sure might have had like one egg in it or maybe a few. I didn't do a very good job. But then sometimes you get you can get hundreds of, of eggs in a really? ziplock. And so those, when we take them back to the lab, we're doing a couple things. We're looking at um, how those, and I think Janelle spoke with everyone yesterday, yes, some of the work yeah. that she's doing yeah. about what Yeah, she was saying that they are actually have set up a lab yeah, in, we'll in your rented photos. house. Yeah, yes. I'll, and I'll take pictures of the lab that, we, that the, the crew has made, which is where you're going to be studying the eggs, right? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of what she's looking at is different temperatures. So you'll see in the photos, some of them are labeled at, with different temperatures because she's going to put some of them in the warmer water and some of them in the cooler water to see because we all know the, the ocean temperatures are changing a lot. Right. And so we want to have a better understanding of what that might mean for the future of Nassau Grouper. So we have a couple of questions. One of them, another question from Cayman Prep. Thanks for keeping them coming. And if anyone wants to ask questions live, you can raise your hand and I'll pull you up. But um, uh, the next question is, what's the top predator in Little Cayman? Ooh, that would be the sharks. sharks. I would say the sharks are the top predator. Those Caribbean reef sharks um, are, are the top predators. And then these big Nassau grouper, they're right up there at the top. What? which is why it's really important that you that we have such a healthy population yeah. in the Cayman Islands because they do a great job of keeping the whole ecosystem in balance. Awesome. Um, and right. they, yeah, they, it's So really, it's really important that they're there. Fairy. And I don't think people necessarily yeah. understand how important it is that you have those top predators out there for mm -hmm. maintaining the health of the rest of the, the yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. Um, well, and we have a question from Miss Mizell's class, and Miss Mizell used to be a researcher on this project too, isn't that right? That's right. Yes, that's right. Miss Mizell was part of our team for years and years and years. It's so great to see you online. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, her question is: What percentage of the fertilized eggs make it to adulthood? Very few. Um, really, like so we're talking. You know, we fifty percent, not fifty percent, probably 1%, one percent, maybe maybe even half percent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's a very small number. All that's why the, the, the reproductive strategy that these NASA group are using is, you know, just putting as many gametes as they, as they can. And then there's no parental care. There's no, you know, taking care of those yeah, no, gametes. They're, they're, they're on gone. Their own. And, um, 
that, you know, because it's up to the predators, it's up to currents and wind and wave, how much health, the healthier the, the gamete, the more likely it's going to survive. And then just a lot of chance. Um, and so and, and we've, this has come up a couple of times before that sometimes you think that maybe none of them recruit, that yeah. maybe, maybe very few actually make it in a, in one year. Yeah. And that might be, it's, and probably there's, there's, we know for sure that some of the um, babies go and make it other places. So the Cayman Islands is an important, you know, source to keep Nassau grouper doing well in other places. But mo we know that most of the, the um, babies make it back here. Right. It's a very, what we call a self-seeding or self-replenishing population where- And you've proven that yeah. from the genetic studies and the fish faces, mm -hmm. right? That we're seeing those same fish come back that, that, and yeah. that the eggs that are coming or the, the, the new young fish are related are to those- from the aggregation. Right. Because I think right. that there was, there was um, some idea that we were getting fish from Cuba or other places or yeah. that they were going off, but it seems that most of them are actually yeah. staying here. So all the, all the protection and work that's happening here is making a difference here, which is really important. That's so amazing. Thank you for that question. Um, Miss Mizell's class. And then we have Cayman prep. So good to see you. Um, how deep are the fish when they're spawning? Great question. Yeah. So last night we saw there, we don't go deeper than about a hundred feet or about 30 meters is our, is as deep as us divers are going to go, but we could see down and there were fish probably as deep as probably 50 meters or more down wow. there spawning. But then a lot of them were up close and they do wherever they start, they do that. You kind of saw that, that spiral dance. And so the ones that are kind of starting where we are, they spiral and they'll get up to about 10 meters maybe when they, and then they all come back down. Wonderful question. Okay. Can't, came and prep, keep them coming. Um, I see what is the location of the groupers when spawning? That's a really good question. So here, on Little Cayman, we're going to the west end of the island where it kind of comes right to a point. So that's the west end spawning aggregation. Now, what about on BRAC? On BRAC, it's on the east end okay. of Cayman BRAC. There used to be an aggregation on Little Cayman on the east end. Oh, so yeah. every year we try and go out there to you check, and check just to make sure that, that uh, you know, some fish, and we know from tracking that the, some fish, older fish, will go and check that old to site. See like, if, make, make sure, am I still in the right place? Should I go over there? No, I'm gonna come back here. So the fish move a lot. They don't just leave their home reef and go out to the spawning site. So they stay. actually are kind of looking around. They're Maybe looking some... around, making sure that that's the, that's the place, that's the party they right. wanna be at. But the other really important part about that moving is that they're teaching the younger fish who haven't gone yet, that this is the way, you know, come right. this way follow me. Right. And we know that those older fish will go out to the spawning site and then they leave, and then they come back. And that's what they're doing is the behavior. They're, sh they're kind of teeth because these are solitary fish. They're not normally with other Nassau oh, no. during the year. And when you see them um, on their, you know, they're solitary and they're territorial, you guys, like they protect their spot and, and they live in that spot their whole life. Mm -hmm. yep. And if another Nassau enters their territory, that's you, not good. You see, you see the color change happen right away. You'll see one of them come and swim up and kind of try to nudge the yeah. other one out of their territory. Mm -hmm. But then on this this week in the winter, yeah. it their behavior absolutely flips. Yeah. And we know, you know, that's a lot of probably what that coloration is, mm -hmm. is kind of that, and I think um, maybe uh, Bryce mentioned that yesterday. That's a little bit of like, hey, it's going to be okay. We're all here. So it's, a know, it's, it's communication. Communication for sure. Right. And that's, I think, also they go out to those points. So it's not just here in the Cayman Islands. All of the spawning aggregations in the Caribbean of all different species, they typically are at points mm -hmm. because that's a good kind of meeting spot. It's an easy, you know, it's like the street corner, right? right. Like, you know, that's an easy spot. Right. But it's also a good place for larval dispersal. Right. And that and that's what, something that um, Dr. Croy was talking about yesterday, that this spot where, where they aggregate is an important spot, mm -hmm. not just for the NASA, but for other fish yeah. as well that spawn. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's why the, the um, Cayman government a couple of years ago through the Marine Parks Act protected all of those spawning aggregations right. because they are really important year round, not just in the winter. There's species that use them year round. OK, thank you. So uh, Spot Bay. 
Hey, you guys, I'm so happy to see you here with us today. We've got a question from Spot Bay. How long is a grouper's lifespan? That's a great question. So um, we think they're typically 25 to 30 years old. There's been some as, as old as 35 to 40 years old, but typically an old one would be, you know, 20 to 25 years. And they don't start going to the spawning aggregation until they're no younger than about six to seven, typically more like eight years before they'll start going. So, so that's why if you're, if you're here right now in any of the islands and you go to a regular reef, you might see a, a young NASA grouper. Because, because they're not, not old enough. Yet. That's right. right. And we had, there was, we had some divers here asking me that last night. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we saw NASA on, on the um, reef. And I said, well, how, how big? You know, about like, let me see, about like that big. How, how, how old of a fish do you think yeah, is about that? So that's, that? you know, getting close, but not quite. maybe four or four. five, you know, but, and so maybe next year. Right. We'll when they first arrive, when they're just this way, yeah, it's, um, opposite. it's <laughs> little, um, they're out in the shallow, rocky reef. Parts. Hiding. Yeah. And hiding eating. and little hiding holes because they're still pretty vulnerable. And then they get big enough that they're going to be the only thing that'll really eat them are sharks after that. All right. Great question, Spot Bay. Um, another one. Um, let's see. Another question from Spot Bay. What is the population of the groupers in Cayman Brac? That is a great question. And we're working hard. Like we said, um, the team went over there the couple days earlier this week and we'll go back later when the weather gets a little um, better later in the week and do another population estimate. But they're definitely on the increase. We don't have good numbers yet for this year. But yeah, Dr. Croy yesterday was saying a couple of couple thousand, thousand was, was yeah, his estimate. Was the last, last yeah. numbers. And, yeah, and that's significantly bigger than previous. I mean, I remember yeah. when... A couple hundred for a while there. When I first came on the project, you guys had a boat out on the brack that mm -hmm. would go out diving the same that you're doing here all the time, and they didn't see yeah, nearly that pretty, many. Yeah. So that's a big in increase. Great. Okay. Great question, Spot Bay. And then Cayman Prep. Uh, what can we do to help the groupers? Yes. Excellent question. Good question. You know, the, the best thing you can do is respect the spawning season because that's going to be when our, the populations are at their most vulnerable. Um, so really it's not just the, but the, at the aggregation itself, but where those fish are moving, you know, they're moving in and out of the, the spawning season, which is why um, the, the DOE decided it was most effective to be able to just protect the grouper during their spawning season. Mm. And, and so I think that's the most important thing. And then knowing how important they are to the, to the ecosystem, the health of the whole, keeping the whole reefs here in balance mm -hmm. and how important, you know, culturally they are to the Cayman Islands. So understanding the story of Nassau grouper and, and how it relates to your family's history and, and why it's so important to have them for the future. Well, and I, and I want to add that you guys are doing the work right now, just by you being here and learning this information about, about your own natural resources, you take that information and you share that with your family and your friends, and that information gets shared among everyone. And that's really what starts to change kind of the public's opinion about, oh yeah, we, this is why we need to protect our reefs. And, and this is what happens when we do protect them. These amazing things happen, like the spawning aggregation that was decimated down to 1500 fish is now up to 7,000, maybe more this yeah. year. Yep. All right. We, let's do one more question. Um, uh, Spot Bay in the next few years, years uh, what is the estimate of groupers in the Cayman Islands? Mm. So what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's an interesting question, you know, and part of like Todd was saying earlier, some years we don't see any recruitment or any little baby Nassau grouper show up in some years. We've seen, you know, hundreds, they're all over. Right. Those, those recruitment years are, are relatively few, infrequent, but so it kind of depends, you know, if we get a good recruitment year, we'll see a big bump in like So some years, years, a bunch of them survive the spawning, yeah. but then some years- It's very few, you know, there's some that make it, right. but not enough for us to notice out on the reef. So you kind of have a bumper crop some years, where, yes. right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see, but we we know that if the protections continue to stay in place, the, the populations are continuing to rebuild. They're definitely not historically before, you know, way back a long time ago, 
the, the original populations were not at those populations yet. So they're still rebuilding to okay. that happen. So what do you think what like historically the population oh here gosh. on on Grant or on Little used yeah, to be? Yeah, it's so hard to know. There's yeah. not really, you know, there's not um, historical data about it. No, but tw you know, more than 10,000, 20,000 maybe. We wow. know there's some places in the Bahamas where there was estimated to be almost over 100,000 NASA groups in one aggregation. At one aggregation. So a lot. I want to see that. <laughs> That's what I want to see. Let's get 100,000. Um, so um, I want to go along with this in the next couple of years. We've seen the numbers increase here and on the BRAC. Mm -hmm. Is there any idea about like maybe maybe grand yeah. something will happen? Yeah, um, there's definitely work happening over there. The, the aggregation there is harder to, to do. Is that because it's of, deeper? It's deeper. It's a little farther offshore. It's a little, it's more remote. So we're coming up with more creative ways to try and better monitor the, the population change there. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, that's the last of the questions, I think. I think we got all yeah, of them. Yep. Like all right. Christy, thank you so yes, much for being you. here. You guys, give Christy a hand. Bye, everyone. I hope to see you when we do the live feed underwater. That'll be really fun. Okay. So, oh, okay. All right, you guys, thank you so much for being here. Now, tomorrow is the big day. Tomorrow, we're gonna take you out on, a, uh, on the Sea Keeper and we're gonna go for a dive on Bloody Bay Wall and we're gonna see uh, you know, one of the most amazing dive sites in the, in the Cayman Islands and certainly in the Caribbean. Um, so we all hope that you guys show up tomorrow at 11 o'clock right here um, and we'll go and we'll see what's under the water. Thanks, you guys, so much for being here. You're awesome. We'll see you tomorrow. Go Grouper Moon. Woo. Bye, you guys. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>